So welcome everyone to this uh, fifth uh, webinar of Unimed Subnetwork on food and water. Uh, it's a pleasure to have so many colleagues here. Uh, some, some of the um, colleagues that are present here today are our uh, partners in the FOSAMED project. It's an Erasmus Plus uh, project. Uh, between uh, UNIMED, uh, the University of Ever in Portugal, the University of Barcelona in Spain, and for uh, Moroccan universities, the uh, IAV, Institut um, Agronomique et Vétérinaire à Saint II, uh, l'Université uh, Mohamed I, uh, l'École Nationale d'Agriculture uh, in Meknes, uh, and I'm missing someone, the colleagues from Ibn Tofail University. Yes, now I've said everyone. So a lot of colleagues are present here today. I welcome you all. I also welcome the other members of the sub-network um, on food and water. It's a pleasure to see some of you uh, again. And for today, we will have uh, two invited uh, guests. And I really hope that you will have uh, that we will have the chance to discuss a bit uh, after they speak. Um, they will mainly talk about the Mediterranean diet and the, on the patterns of the Mediterranean diet and on the patterns of adherence to this Mediterranean diet. But before I introduce uh, the two colleagues, let's hear a few words from our. Uh, colleague Marcello, director of uh, UNIMED, who is here today from Pizza, here Marcello. Today from Pizza, thanks Marta. I'm here in Pizza for a meeting uh, uh, in particular in another project with uh, where also University of Evora is a fundamental partner. The project is called APRISE and it is a project on uh, to support Kurdish universities from Iraq uh, to improve the governance of the education system, Kurdish system. Uh, it's quite, quite interesting to work uh, with Kurdish universities and to see how familiar they are in, in uh, with talking about Mediterranean. I think that we can say that is a sort of large Mediterranean cooperation. Uh, coming back to the objective of this webinar, thank you very much for this opportunity to continue the work and the discussion among the sub-network of food and water, which I consider one of the most important sub-networks in UNIMED uh, for the work that we are doing, for the first results that we are collecting, but more importantly for the work that we have in front of us. Uh, as you know, uh, European Commission, in particular the G Research, is working is working jointly with the Union for Mediterranean to uh, prepare the new work plan of Horizon Europe program for 2023 and 2024. And uh, the three main priorities to uh, address are. Uh, uh, climate change, uh, the Green Deal, and Earth. Uh, if you think, uh, if you, you can easily understand how important it is, in particular for all these three dimensions, uh, the impact in your work in food and water sector. This is the reason why I think that this thematic group of work, thematic group of cooperation among us, is extremely important for the future of our cooperation, looking in particular what it's doing, and looking also uh, the fact that they are looking uh, to, uh, to have a more uh, concrete feedback and cooperation coming from research uh, from southern Mediterranean countries. Uh, and I think that the exercises that we are doing all together could guarantee some contribution, some concrete contribution. I hope so. In addition to that, we have the other program, which uh, you are absolutely familiar, the Prima program, which remain another important 
and difficult chapter of our cooperation. You know that it's very difficult, so it's challenging, the success rate is very limited. But in any case, we have to insist on this, we have to work on this, and I'm sure that step by step or little by little, we will be able to achieve also important results. In addition to that, I inform you about this year, and I hope that some of you, in the framework of your universities or independent by that, will be able to. The first event is the Unimed Assembly, a place in Amman at the University of Jordan on 22nd and 23rd of June. And we will see if we could imagine a specific session dedicated to the priority of our subnetwork. The second one will be the Unimed Week in Brussels. Some of you are already familiar with these events. Uh, I hope that this year we will come back uh, to uh, on presence events, not online, or at least an hybrid events. And the Unimed Week this year will be in September, late September or beginning of October. We are still negotiating with the date with the European Commission. And the third one is a new one that we will try to organize by the end of the year, which is a UNIMED students uh, event, a UNIMED students meeting. We would like to invite students from our network, from our countries, from our universities to join in our two days of workshops to debate about youth priorities, students' priorities, and so on. In such occasion, our role is to our role, when I mean our role, I mean UNIMED, but also our members, to listen what our students are addressing to us. Uh, again, thank you very much for the work that you are doing. Uh, I'm very, I have to thank, obviously, the University of Evora, Marta and Sonia in particular for the work that they are doing, but all the Evora community. And obviously our colleagues from EAV, uh, from Morocco, and all the folks also Ludovica from our side for uh, to guarantee the continuity of this uh, activity and the UNIMED contribution. And again, I hope to uh, to see you in some other occasion, hopefully in presence. And uh, I wish you a very uh, nice meeting. Bye. Thank you, Marcello. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. And let's hope that we see each other soon in presence in Brussels or Amman or whatever. In Portugal. I will be in Portugal at the beginning of April. Which so we, oh, so we will meet sooner. So we will meet sooner. <laughs> Bye. Bye. So now I have the pleasure to welcome our first speaker for this afternoon, Maria Fernanda. Uh, she's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Barcelona in Spain. And today she will talk to us about lifestyle and adherence to the Mediterranean diet. Sleep and physical activity are also part of this uh, equation. Uh, Maria Fernanda, I welcome you once again. And I thank you very much for accepting our invitation and accepting the challenge to be here today. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Hello, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, as well to, to Marta and to Sonia for the organization of this event and, and for, for all the people that's involved uh, well, who are making us possible to be here today and to all the, the, the public. So today I'm really glad to be here presenting uh, and to share with you why uh, the adherence to the Mediterranean diet is also associated with, a, with sleep and physical activity. And so our lifestyle is also an, an important variable, which is part of the, of the work that we do here at, at the University of Barcelona. We are all aware we are all aware that the Mediterranean diet is one of the most studied and well-known patterns uh, worldwide. 
because, well, it has been associated with a wide range of benefits for health. And I think like the first results that, I, uh, that showed us that the Mediterranean diet was also a healthy dietary pattern was that it was associated with uh, a decrease in the cardiovascular risk. But in the passing years, we have we also known that a, a greater adherence to this uh, healthy dietary pattern is associated with lower obesity rates. And of course, it's also associated with other metabolic benefits, including an improved glycemic control. We all know that the Mediterranean diet recommends a plant-based uh, plant diet, which is, uh, which, a poor, uh, which give us uh, a wide range of benefits because it's rich in fiber, in polyphenols, in antioxidants. So not only it's associated with an improved glycemic control, but it's also associated with a decrease in age-related cognitive dysfunction, with uh, lower mortality rates. And of course, if mortality is reduced, longevity is going to be uh, improved. And here at the University of Barcelona, we have also seen that the adherence to the Mediterranean diet is also a key, for example, for weight loss in patients with obesity who have been subjected to, uh, subjected to endoscopic bariatric treatments, which is a specific obesity treatment. What we've seen is that uh, patients who were recommended to follow a Mediterranean uh, dietary pattern lost more weight compared to those patients who uh, actually followed a protein diet plan. So what we, one of the possible mechanisms was that, of course, the Mediterranean diet is, an, is a dietary pattern that it's not only healthy, but it's easy to, to follow and it's attractive enough for patients to adhere to this kind of treatment. And of course, we cannot forget that these favorable health effects, not only weight loss, but also the protection towards cardiovascular disease and obesity and neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative uh, and pathologies uh, could be attributed to the synergistic combination of nutrients resulting in antioxidant, anti-inflammatory and improve also antithrombotic properties in the human body. Let's not forget, as I was telling you, that the Mediterranean diet is a healthy dietary pattern that is characterized by an abundance of plant-based uh, foods, also uh, moderate intake of fish and, and dairy and low intake of meat. And also, we also know that uh, olive oil, extra virgin olive oil is a, a great part of this dietary pattern. All, all of these characteristics are represented in the Mediterranean diet pyramid. But what I would also like to highlight is that the Mediterranean diet, it's not just a, a, a healthy dietary pattern, but it's also a lifestyle. As you can see, um, this, this healthy dietary pattern also uh, promotes the biodiversity, the seasonality, eating fresh food, eating local food, eating a variety of food, so all of this is what makes uh, the Mediterranean diet not only a healthy dietary pattern, but also easy to follow in, this, in, this, uh, in these communities. And I would also like to, to highlight that these benefits not only stay in sustainability, but it also extends to preserving traditional, cult the traditional uh, cultures, uh, maintaining conviviality, and also part of this Mediterranean lifestyle or Mediterranean diet is um, of this recommendation is to improve or maintain regular physical activity and adequate rest. However, I would like to say, as I will explain uh, further on in this presentation, that these two habits are also important to maintain the adherence to this healthy lifestyle. So taking into account all of the above, the Mediterranean diet has been highlighted as the best example of a healthy diet. And this is from a, go a global perspective, and especially considering that uh, the Mediterranean diet is uh, sustainable and is also healthy. And this attribute was, uh, was considered to the Mediterranean diet by the Eat Lancet Commission on 2019. So, we all know that the Mediterranean diet is healthy, that is sustainable, and that is good for all of us, and that we should follow it. However, uh, with the modernization of society, we also know that this traditional Mediterranean uh, diet is being abandoned by young generations. 
we cannot ignore that with the modernization of society, there has been a lot of changes in the way how food is produced, uh, our intensive uh, agriculture, also the way how food is distributed. We also know that right now we have access to practically any kind of food from all over the world from our from our city of from the city in which we live in. So these are all all parts we need to consider because all of these factors and all of this modernization has been associated with the westernization of the of the dietary pattern and of course it has uh, been associated with uh, a greater sedentarism among among our our society not surprisingly weight progress weight problems and obesity are increasing at a, at a rapid rate in the ua in the uae member state Actually, it is estimated that approximately 50% of the adult population is, has overweight, and well, these are uh, rates from 2019. But I would like to highlight the, um, the position of Spain, because for example, here in Spain, 50% of the population is overweight despite this healthy, uh, this healthy dietary pattern. So it has to do a lot with, the, with this modern lifestyle and the way we are living. Of course, this modern lifestyle and this uh, westernization of the dietary pattern is, is leading us to a low diet quality, which could be associated with obesity. And of course, in this equation, sedentarism is really, really important. And what, what we're seeing is that uh, people who adhere to low diet quality also uh, tend to be more overweight. And here, a concept that is interesting is self-concept because what researchers are, are telling us is that the, the worse the diet quality, the worse the, the, uh, the, the body mass index, and then the worse the self-concept, this concept. So it's kind of a vicious circle. What is interesting at this point is kind of the opposite approach because our researchers also told us, have, uh, has, has taught us that individuals who exercise regularly tend to consume a more nutritious diet in such a way that uh, those who have a good adherence to the Mediterranean diet also practice more physical activity. And this could be a positive, uh, a positive cycle, which could also help us to achieve a normal weight, which could be associated with some of our research, uh, recent research here at the University of Barcelona where we observe that individuals with a greater diet quality also practice more physical activity, also plan more time to do physical activity, and uh, which is uh, in line with other, with other statements and with other authors who say that those who ex exercise regularly tend to have better nutritional levels or tend to adhere more to healthy dietary pattern, and this includes the Mediterranean diet. Uh, some possible mechanisms could be that individuals with, uh, who adhere or, or who practice physical activity regularly are more interested in having a good diet quality because they would like to obtain better results from sports performance, body image. They, they, they are interested also in obtaining the, the greatest well-being. So here, the physical activity and the adherence to the Mediterranean diet are closely linked together and should be um, and should be recommended and potentiated. However, another aspect in this equation of modernization is the access that we have, uh, well, to technology at night, to light at night, which have also uh, modified our daily routines. So right now we are more sedentary. And we have less time to sleep because I, I mean, we have long commute hours or we have to work till late or even we like to stay up late watching our, I don't know, TV series or so. So this is why the association between uh, the Mediterranean diet uh, and the adherence to the Mediterranean diet and the lifestyle is also a matter of time, especially sleep timing. Why? Because every day we have to deal with a hectic uh, school and social schedules. Here we have we wake up early because we have to go to, to, to school or to work early, but we also stay up late. And we every day uh, interact or engage with mobile phones or, and with technology, which, which 
what they are associated is with the delay in sleep timing. And what happens in the morning? Well, in the morning, we are dealing every day with the alarm clock. And all of these factors, what are doing us is that we're sleeping less every year. Studies have shown that from several decades uh, until now, we've been, sleep, uh, we've been sleeping less. And this is due to this modern lifestyle and all these commodities, which I, I'm not telling are, are, are not, I'm not uh, denying they are, they are commodities, but we do need to, to be aware in the way how we engage and how we interact with all these environmental factors. In this case, what we study here at the University of Barcelona is the impact of the social jet lag on the adherence to the Mediterranean diet. So let me explain you what is the social jet lag. The social jet lag describes the, 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 the change in sleep timing on weekends, on weekdays versus weekends. As you can see every day, it doesn't matter at what time we go to sleep, we have to wake up early because we need to go to school, get the kids to school or get to work or anything. So every day uh, during weekdays, we accumulate and sleep uh, and a sleep debt. A sleep debt that we pay for on weekends by sleeping more. Why do we sleep more on weekends? Because we don't need to wake up early. So we try to, to recover from this sleep from this sleep debt. And this this uh, sleeping in a little bit more on weekends and this change of schedules is what is making us uh, suffer from social jet lag. So what we've, what we've seen here at the University of Barcelona is that the greatest the social jet lag, that is the greatest the, the sleep uh, timing changes on weekends versus weekdays, the, the lower the, the adherence to the Mediterranean diet. So it's really interesting to see how uh, this sleep timing is affecting also the way how we, uh, the way how we eat. And specifically, what uh, literature told us is that sleep duration was kind of a link between uh, social jet lag and this lower adherence to the Mediterranean diet. Uh, more specifically, we observed that these individuals with higher or with greater social jet lag had uh, a lower consumption of fruits, of vegetables, and they also tend to skip for breakfast. So you're probably uh, wondering, well, what's really the link between this uh, poor adherence and this irregular uh, sleep timing on weekends versus weekdays? Well, um, it may, some literature has told us that inadequate sleep, that is sleeping less or uh, having a poor sleep quality, it's associated with alterations in the regulation of food intake. This means that if we have not slept well, or if we if our sleep quality is not good, then we are we're gonna be more hungry because we're gonna have less less ghrelin or leptin, and this is going to lead us to having more appetite. In addition, uh, when inadequate sleep is associated with increased hedonic drive for food. What this is telling us is that this food that is rich in fat and in, in sugar is going to be more pleasurable for us, more palatable. So <clears throat> I'm sorry, we're going to try to look for this kind of food when we have not slept well. It's kind of a compensatory mechanism. Of course, it's negative. However, if we don't sleep good, we have more chances to adhere less to these healthy dietary patterns, including the Mediterranean diet. And of course, if we sleep less, less time during the day, we're going to be more times to be, we're, we're going we're, we're gonna to have more time to be awake. So this is going to, uh, to be associated with more opportunities to eat. And of course, it's important to say that at night, especially in the last part of the day, these greater opportunities to eat are most likely associated with snacks, with snacking and with snacking on healthy food, which also would be associated with a lower adherence to healthy diet. And returning to the link between physical activity and the adherence to the Mediterranean diet, I would, also, and I would also say in this case that if we don't sleep good, we're go also going to be more fatigued the next day. So it's less likely that we're going to have 
more physical activity. So if we are more fatigued, we are most likely going to be less active. And this would let us again to less energy expenditure. So all of these mechanisms are also mechanisms linking inadequate sleep with obesity and with a higher weight status. Not surprisingly, our results also, show, also showed that higher social jet lag was also associated with a higher body mass index. So uh, it's really important uh, to mention or, or to notice how our daily routines are also affecting our lifestyle habits. And this includes the adherence to this healthy dietary pattern. Uh, other things that, that we have uh, investigated is the association between the sleep quality per se and the adherence to the Mediterranean diet. And in this case, what we observe is that poor sleep quality is associated with a, a lower adherence to the Mediterranean diet. If you want to know if you have slept well, you only have to ask to yourself one question. In the next day, are you well rested? And another question would be, how do you feel? during the day. Are you active? This would, uh, this, this would tell you that you have sleep, sleep good. The mechanisms linking poor sleep quality with, poor, with a lower adherence to the Mediterranean diet, uh, I already explained. But we also observed in this, in this research work is that poor sleep quality was also associated with eating behaviors. In this case, we observed that poor sleep quality was associated with greater emotional eating and also with greater uncontrolled eating. So what's emotional eating? Emotional eating, what, is, what it is telling us is that uh, when we have not slept good, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna eat in response to negative emotions. So uh, we're gonna eat if we feel sad, angry, tense, uh, I don't know, nervous, we're gonna have the tendency to eat. And regarding uncontrolled eating, uncontrolled eating tells us that we're gonna have the, the feeling that we're losing control over food intake. And what's interesting regarding this eating behaviors and the adherence to the Mediterranean diet is that greater emotional eating and greater uncontrolled eating was associated in general with a lower adherence to the Mediterranean diet, but also, or in particular, with increased fast food and increased candy and sweets intake. So again, what this is telling us is that if we don't sleep good, then we'll have more chances to respond badly to negative emotions or to cope these negative emotions with food. And this, as, as we all said, will have some certain impact on the body mass index. In addition, we observe that individuals with poor sleep quality also have a greater cognitive restraint. But this eating behavior, it's, uh, what it describes is like the conscious effort that we do to control food intake to control weight. So in this case, we observe that these individuals with greater cognitive restraint, they, have, uh, they tend to have a better adherence to the Mediterranean diet and they tend to, and they tend to, increase, to, to consume more fruits and more vegetables. What was interesting about, uh, about this, this uh, research work was that uh, the relationship between sleep quality and body mass index could be mediated by, by eating behavior. Such a way that if we don't sleep well, that's, that's poor sleep quality, we're gonna be more prone to, to, to eat and to cope with negative emotions with food. And this would lead us to a higher body mass index. And the same thing happens with cognitive restraint. In this case, if we have a poor sleep quality, we're more prone to, uh, to restrain what we, what we eat. And this paradoxically would lead us to a greater BMI. So I think, and I know this right now sounds like a paradox, but it do has an explanation. What happens? Well, if we, are, if we restrict food intake chronically and constantly, we're restricting food intake as it happens with cognitive restraint or with greater cognitive restraint, we we're more likely to engage in binge eating. What's binge eating? Well, we're more prone to also lose control about this, this food intake. And this loss of control would lead us to weight gain. And if we gain weight, or if these individuals gain weight, then they're 
all they are uh, again more prone to restrict food intake so it's kind of a vicious cycle that it would be interesting to to investigate to further investigate whether uh, improving this sleep quality would we could also break this uh, vicious cycle which is what our our recent findings have have taught us uh, but what is also interesting is that the relationship between sleep quality and diet quality is bidirectional in such a way that the better we sleep, the better the diet quality, and also the better the diet quality, the better the sleep quality. Uh, in this case, what we also investigated is the role of the Mediterranean diet and of, in particular of, of the items of the Mediterranean diet, which would be associated with an improved uh, sleep quality. And what, what we observe is that regular fish consumption and regular nut consumption that is uh, consuming these foods two to three times per day was associated with an improved sleep quality. I would like to say that in the case of this assessment tool, the lower the score, the better the diet quality. So uh, I would like to highlight the role of omega-3 fatty acids, which are uh, nutrients that could be associated with an improved cognitive and neuronal function. And also they could be associated with the synthesis or, and the secretion of melatonin. Melatonin is a, a hormone that is uh, closely associated with sleep regulation. And also regarding especially the role of nut consumption, we have, we, what literature tells us is that nuts are kind of a rich uh, nutrient foods with tryptophan, which is a precursor of which in the body is converted to serotonin and serotonin in the body is, is converted into melatonin. So uh, nuts would be kind of this great packaged food that could also potentiate sleep because all uh, some of their nutrients could, would be involved in melatonin secretion, which as I was telling you, is a, a hormone that is closely related to sleep. However, more evidence needs to be granted to, to prove that these are uh, in fact sleep promoting food, which is why here at the University of Barcelona, we are developing right now a randomized control trial especially to see whether this regular nut consumption could be associated with an improved sleep. So my take home message would be that in fact, the Mediterranean diet is the best reference for a healthy and sustainable diet. However, the adherence to this healthy dietary pattern could be influenced by other lifestyle habits, including physical activity and sleep. So I think at this point, we need to, to start thinking about our daily routines and how they are making us uh, live better and, and healthier thanks to the adherence to, to healthy dietary patterns. So thank you all for, for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Fernanda, for your excellent presentation and for keeping almost on time. <laughs> I forgot to say <laughs> at the beginning how many how much time you had and uh, I was uh, hoping that you'd stayed on time. Thank you very much. I would, uh, if you don't mind, I would like to have a debate uh, at the, the end. So I think we can proceed Perfect. with the um, presentation from Elsa. It's my great pleasure to present my colleague. Uh, she's also the colleague next, next door. So <laughs> hi Elsa. Uh, Elsa is a researcher here at uh, our research institute at the University of Evora, and today she will uh, talk to us about the adherence to the Mediterranean diet and the influence of taste perception, and she will present a case study that she has uh, done here in Portugal. Elsa, the floor is yours. You may share your presentation. Thank you very much. Sorry for being with the mask, but I'm not alone in the room, so <laughs> sorry for that. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I will share my screen. Okay. You can see it? Yes. Yes, okay. So as uh, Marta told, I will present I will present um, a, a case study that uh, we done 
uh, during the PhD of one of my students uh, in Portugal. We study the, our region, that is the so uh, southern east region of Portugal, and we try to see the relationship between the adherence to Mediterranean diet and the taste perception, the, the gustatory function. Okay. Okay, I will take now I, <laughs> I'm alone. Okay, so as Fernanda told, a Mediterranean diet is more than a healthy lifestyle, is recognized uh, by being healthy, but is also uh, related with culture and tradition, and of course, uh, with the, uh, as a lifestyle uh, with uh, other aspects like, like physical activity. And now we could see that uh, sleep patterns are very important also in, in this type of um, pattern. So Mediterranean diet um, is very old, but even being very old, it started to be studied in the, in the years uh, 50 of the last century. And it started um, with Ansel Keys that saw in different countries um, that Greece, a Mediterranean country, ha had a, a diet that seems to prevent uh, from cardiovascular events. And um, that is a, a diet that now we recognize as Mediterranean diet. And here in Portugal, we are not in Mediterranean, but we are very close and we, we have a great influence. And typically, we have the Mediterranean diet as our uh, diet. But um, our uh, behavior, our um, dietary patterns are not so much related as the, uh, as Medi with Mediterranean diet as we would like to be. And the data from um, the, the last, um, well, the last six years, uh, from 16 and uh, 2016 and 2020, uh, show that uh, we have higher consumption of fat, higher consumption of uh, uh, animal proteins, and lower consumption of vegetable-based products, name, namely pulses, vegetables, and fruits, than the recommendations. And the National Health Authority um, uh, show data from uh, 2020 where they requested, when they asked uh, Portuguese people about Mediterranean diet, if they heard about the Mediterranean diet and if they know what is the Mediterranean diet. And the results uh, show that uh, around 62% of individuals report uh, to hear about Mediterranean diet. From these 80% tell that uh, they know what is Mediterranean diet. So, uh, in global terms, we have half of people uh, knowing or being aware about Mediterranean diet. But when they uh, looked for the adherence to this uh, type of diet, uh, they found that in Portugal, almost only uh, qu uh, one quarter of the population re uh, have a high adherence to this Mediterranean diet. So once more, as Fernanda told, uh, we are decreasing our uh, adherence to this dietary pattern. And uh, when we look for uh, the products to which it seems to be more difficult to accomplish the recommendations, we look for vegetable-based uh, products, uh, legumes, vegetables, fruits, and nuts that are, um, are referred by most of the population as being uh, lower than the recommendations. And when the people uh, uh, say why they don't eat much of these products, uh, something that came uh, with more frequency of answers than others uh, are that, that they don't like the taste or even they don't know exactly how to cook these foods to, to have another taste. And what these um, foods have in common is that they are not very nice in terms of texture, but and they are rich in polyphenols, so they can be bitter, they can be astringent, and can be somehow uh, sour. What are sensory characteristics that may lead to some degree of reje rejection? So because of this, um, we developed the study 
where we try to see what, the, uh, what was the level, uh, the address level of the population from a Lentejo region to Mediterranean diet, and mostly uh, at what, uh, time, uh, at what uh, extent is gustatory function related with these address levels. So we did this in um, 370 people. We have a balanced distribution between women and men. We, we did this only in adults. And what we evaluated was, uh, were the dietary habits to, to, um, through food frequency questionnaires. Further, we converted uh, these data uh, using the MEDA score, a score to, um, to assess Mediterranean diet adherence developed um, through a project, the, the um, primate project from uh, where the University of Barcelona is also involved. Uh, we assessed also um, the intake frequency and preference of a list of 50 fruits and vegetables, which uh, we detailed because we want to see uh, particular preferences uh, for, um, for uh, items that are different according to their sensory characteristics. And we introduced another uh, variable that was the frequency and the preference uh, for herbs and spices that we know that are very common, traditionally very uh, common in uh, Portuguese cuisine. So we assessed also the height and weight of the participants, uh, sorry for the mistake, the physical activity levels and gustatory function through assessing taste thresholds. Uh, that means the lower concentration of taste that was detected, supra thresholds, the intensity um, of uh, one of the con detected concentrations and the hedonics for sweetness, bitterness, sourness, uh, and saltiness. So in terms of adherence levels, our data unfortunately was not better than the national data, even a little lower. We have 20% uh, of participants that uh, have a high adherence to Mediterranean diet. We have even more that have a very low adherence to, either, uh, to Mediterranean diet. And when we look um, and when we compare men and women, we, we see that we have a lower adherence in men than in women. Besides that, um, we saw that it are the adults with higher age that have higher adherence levels uh, comparatively, comparatively to young adults. Relating with body mass index, uh, we could not see differences. Uh, of course, we, we agree with the presentation of Fernanda that Mediterranean diet can be related with the lower body mass index, but in our sample, we did not see this association. Uh, and when we looked again for the items of matters uh, uh, that were more or less uh, um, accomplished by the participants, we could see that uh, all, more than 80% could cannot accomplish the recommendations of vegetables and almost 80% does, does not accomplish the recommendations of pulses. So this goes in line with uh, what I referred before for the national um, level. So our population is not very far from the, the medium uh, Portuguese population. Once more, we are seeing that the lower levels, um, lower intakes uh, are at the level of the low palatability products. When we um, uh, try to assess how this is associated with gustatory function, we could uh, uh, obtain a model where we see that older adults that are less sensitive to salty and more sensitive to sweet tend to have higher Mediterranean diet scores. Of course, uh, that this it, oh, sorry. This is a, a moderated relationship. We can only explain Mediterranean diet score uh, by 7%. This is not uh, a, a big explanation, but even, even so, we consider that is uh, relevant uh, to have this in mind because we know that uh, adherence to Mediterranean diet and to dietary patterns in general um, are regulated 
by many factors. So to have something nearly significant in terms of gustatory function for us seems to be uh, something that needs to be uh, explored. And it is interesting to see uh, this relationship between sweetness or a tendency for the relationship between uh, sweetness and the Mediterranean diet uh, scores because um, in, a, in, uh, in another uh, study, we could see that uh, taste thresholds, so the, the lower concentrations that are already detected as tasting um, bitter and sweet are related with fruit and vegetable preferences. So uh, this, me this means that this um, effect that bitter, uh, sorry, that sweetness can have on Mediterranean diet acceptance uh, can be, of course, linked to higher preference of fruits and vegetables by people that have higher sweetness sensitivity. Looking for the use of, um, of seasonings, and I'm sorry for the mistakes that I'm noticing now, uh, we see not a very strong, uh, at least, uh, we see a low but a significant correlation between the use of seasonings, herbs and spices, and the uh, score of Mediterranean uh, diet. And the most uh, uh, used and um, uh, seasonings uh, in, our, um, in our region are parsley, thyme, oregano, mint, paprika, coriander, garlic, and cinnamon. So th these are the most frequently used and more related with the uh, Mediterranean dietary uh, pattern. Uh, we try to look uh, how the use of uh, these uh, seasonings could be related, um, not only with the, the adherence to Mediterranean diet, but also with the gustatory function. So for, for doing this, we decided to use a principal component analysis to reduce the number of um, seasoning the variables to uh, components that we could use further uh, to relate with gustatory function. We could um, obtain uh, six components explaining 60% uh, uh, of the variance. We have a component uh, related with the intake of chili pepper, oregano, and white and black pepper, another one more related with the consumption of bell pepper, the other one more diverse, but uh, with the, the, the seasonings uh, most uh, used in the in Alentejo region, another one with penny royal and thyme, garlic and powder uh, and pink pepper, and capsicum, paprika and bay leaf. So this component um, with, uh, with the seasonings mo most uh, intense in terms of uh, flavor. And what uh, was uh, observed is that uh, the, the component that mostly uh, relate with the adherence scores of the Mediterranean diet are the garlic, cinnamon, bay leaf, thyme, mint, and coriander. So uh, many of the seasonings that I referred before that are related uh, with um, that we saw before related with Mediterranean diet. And when we relate this with the uh, um, gustatory function, uh, we could obtain uh, three different clusters. Two of them are um, very different in terms of the use of seasonings. Uh, cluster one has a low intake of uh, uh, almost seasonings, whereas cluster two have high intake of um, seasonings, and we can see that uh, they uh, can be distinguished uh, distingui uh, between uh, among them um, for the sweetness preference, the bitterness preference, and the intensity of perception, and saltiness um, intensity of perception and preference. So we can conclude that uh, the high seasoning intake uh, occurs in individuals that also have higher sweetness and saltiness uh, pr um, preferences and lower bitterness preferences. Uh, this is also true for individuals with lower sensitivity to salty taste, but that have simultaneously higher preference for this taste. And another thing that seems uh, to us very interesting is that when we put the sodium intake 
um, in this equation. And when I mean the sodium intake is not the added sodium, but the intake that we can extrapolate from the food frequency questionnaires, we see that people that most that have the higher uh, seasonings intake are also the people that consume higher levels of sodium in total. So we can see that it's not because they use seasonings that they decrease the levels of sodium. So in summary, and the, the main um, uh, conclusions that we can get from this uh, study is that we have a low Mediterranean diet uh, address. Uh, this, uh, this means that we really need uh, to promote this uh, dietary type and we need to insist in very effective ways of promoting uh, Mediterranean diet address. And uh, this is low um, even more in men and in young adults. So uh, it is probably if we don't change this in the next years, we will have a higher decrease in address because the young adults will be the further uh, hold out adults. Uh, vegetables and pulses uh, are eaten that uh, are failed in terms of recommendations by a, a very high per percentage of people. Um, on the other hand, we see a tendency for association between Mediterranean diet adherence and salty and sweet taste sensitivities, and, and this needs to be further explored to know exactly how this uh, biological characteristic uh, uh, is uh, really influencing a higher or lower acceptance of the foods from the Mediterranean diet patterns, and also that seasonings in, uh, intake are related with Mediterranean diet. Uh, higher intake of seasonings, however, does not mean lower sodium intake. And this is important because this means that uh, the strategies for promoting the, the use of seasonings uh, in re by replacing salt uh, needs to have a message because probably people that use seasonings use that because they like very strong flavors and not to replace uh, the intake of sodium uh, and higher intake of seasonings by people uh, with lower sensitive, uh, sensitiveness to saltiness and higher preference for salt and sweet taste uh, uh, are also aspects that uh, um, need to be considered and as I told need to be explored in further studies. So I think sweet and salty tastes, uh, taste function uh, requires attention when we talk about Mediterranean diet adherence. And thank you very much again for the invitation and for your attention. Any question that you have, uh, I'm available.